So thank you for joining us today for our biological webinar series. Um, we've got a great guest today, and uh, I guess I'll start by saying that uh, my name is Jaken Burns, and you're probably used to seeing Dylan uh, kind of be hosting the webinars, but I'm filling in for him today um, as he had kind of a family thing to attend today. And um, so we're excited. This is the last webinar of our biological webinar series. So we're we're going out on a very strong note. Um, and with that, I guess the only thing I'll say before I hand it over to Keith is we may try to wrap this up at 12.55 or right at one or maybe a couple minutes early um, for Sham to get, to get going to other priorities. Um, but with that, um, Keith, why don't you go ahead and introduce our guest? Yep. Thank you, Jaken. And welcome everybody to our eight, I believe this is number eight in our series, eighth and final one in our biological webinar series. It's been a great series. When we first started putting this together, we thought, well, maybe if we can pull together four of these, we'll be doing pretty good. But we kept coming up with great ideas and, and uh, speakers that were willing to share their information and expertise. So we just kind of kept adding on to it. And it's, it's, been a, it's been a great series. And uh, like Jake and said, we're excited uh, to have Sham on. Sham uh, Moti, is, uh, he's been a friend of Green Cover for, for a number of years. Uh, Sham's background is uh, in microbiology. Sham actually came to the United States uh, way back in his college days. Uh, from the little country of Guyana, uh, South America. So uh, Sham actually still has a farm down there, travels back and forth. Uh, so he actually farms on two different continents, but he came from Guyana over to the University of Minnesota and went to school there and really never left. Uh, so his, his home here in the States uh, is still in Minnesota. And I, I asked him, I said, <laughs> You know, it doesn't make people think you're very smart if you came from a nice, warm, tropical country and you moved to Minnesota. Uh, but he didn't have to stay there through the teeth of the winter. So uh, it's exciting to have have him on and have his his expertise, not just in, in the field, because because he, he owns a farm in Minnesota. He owns one in South America. But the majority of his career has been working as a scientist and as a businessman and as a business development leader. Uh, for a number of different companies uh, across the biological spectrum. And, and uh, most recently, uh, he and Dale Strickler, yeah, many of you know Dale, Dale's no longer with Green Cover, uh, but was with our team for many years and, and really helped us get to where we're at now, particularly in the biologicals. Sean and Dale worked together at Valent and they worked on the mycorrhiza applications line of products. And so that's kind of where we got to know him uh, was through that. Uh, and then we've continued to get to know them. Many of you are familiar with our MycoGreen NPK, our new mycorrhiza product uh, from a company in India called Umahari. And uh, Sham is kind of working as an advisor uh, uh, consultant to them uh, on developing some of those products and helping us with those uh, here in the States as well. So uh, lots of background, lots of interesting connections that Sham has. Uh, and so I've asked him to come on because Mycorrhiza have been referenced by, I think, just about all previous seven of these biological webinars, Sham, because they're such a keystone species. And so I've asked Sham uh, to talk about that, at, at least part of that, about that. But I want Sham to give a, a, a bit more of a robust introduction and a background. And then, uh, like I say, he's not just a scientist, but he's got a great mind for business, does a lot of training, a lot of education as well. And so uh, we're going to let him talk a little bit about, you know, some thoughts he has around sustainability and regeneration. And then Sham and I will kind of jump into a bit of a discussion uh, about mycorrhiza and, and some of the things associated with that. So Sham, with that, I'm going to let you take it away. Thank you, Keith. Um, people always wonder if when we start this out, do I speak English? Yes, I do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks for the introduction. Uh, you know, um, Apart from all the microbiology and stuff, I am basically an agronomist and soil scientist. Um, my career started out way back in the 60s when I was a chemistry and science teacher. And so I had a, a science background for way back. I kind of got away from science for a while, got into business management and global business management and stuff like that. So, um, but uh, I still farm. I farm in Minnesota, um, do the corn and soybeans. I go back to South America and we do rice farming. But my farm in Minnesota is basically one big research farm. I try a lot of different things. And, and my goal basically is to practice 
I take a holistic approach to sustainability. Now that, that's a very, very big topic. Um, one thing I do, I'm an author, I write, um, I publish books and I'm in the process of writing a book and taking a holistic approach to sustainability and what it is and, and, and what does it mean to the world as a whole. And, um, you know, my farm is sustainable. Um, it's powered by solar. I got, you know, pollinator gardens and honeybees and my farm is between two lakes. So we have water filtration systems. But the number one thing I try to do on my farm is I try to be very efficient on my input costs. And one of the input things I try to manage is, um, is fertilizer. And this is where this topic comes in about mycorrhiza and soil biology as a whole. Um, how can we be more efficient in our input costs? And a lot of times I, I, I ask people before you do anything, get a soil test. Because if you don't know what you have, how do you correct the deficiencies? And um, we talk a lot about nutritious food because it, that's you know, what we do, we grow food, we grow crops for food or for whatever purpose. But if the soil doesn't have it, the grain can't have it. And we try to explain that, that not only the NPKs, but also um, the, the micronutrients and all these other things. And, and it all wraps up with these um, microorganisms. Now, there are a lot of microorganisms in the soil, different kinds, everything from algae to um, bacteria, fungi, whatever the case may be. And somebody estimated one time that if we take one teaspoon of soil, there are more microbes in there than there are people on earth. And now I don't know who counted them, but um, it's an estim estimation. Yeah. There are a lot of microbes in there and they do a lot of different things. And we're, you know, we don't have all the answers. We're learning. We started, I, I started this whole process back in 1983 and we made a lot of mistakes. For example, you know, we talk about mycorrhiza, and I remember once upon a time when we first started introducing different formulations of mycorrhiza to different companies, we would put them in liquid um, solutions and we'd put them in public warehouses. And um, what we end up doing, we sold a lot of dead bugs. We, I keep making fun of that because we didn't know, we didn't understand the whole process. And so at one time when I was at Valent, we had some pro products so stored in a public warehouse in um in uh, around Fargo, North Dakota. And of course, between the freeze and, uh, and the humidity and whatever else, summer, winter. Um, after six months, we analyzed some of the product and we're less than 50% uh, viable. And uh, when that starts happening, it goes downhill fast. So we've learned that we have to do these things a little bit more scientifically and store them in some better places. So on, on my farm, basically, in case you know, I talk about this, I have a uh, temperature control room if I have product, I put them in there. I try, try to maintain it, you know, um, between 50 and 65 degrees year round. And so the, the product doesn't, um, doesn't really, um, the, the bugs don't die, put it bluntly. These organisms, they're live organisms. And so we have to make sure. So when we made this formulation, this microgreen uh, NPK, we made it with the understanding that if properly stored, I mean, it's good, the shelf life is two years. That, that's what we, we claim on it. It, it, it. We know it has two year shelf life. It doesn't mean that after two years that they're all dead. It means that we start having declining, just like people as we get older, you know, the, the people get older, they become weaker, they die, whatever the case may be. But the product is good for two years. And after two years, you know, we, decision time, we want to rework it, what do you want to do with it? But most most people would buy the product within two years, they'll use it up. This product, you know, it, it comes in a dry, um, formulation and um, you can put it in a seed, you can um, you can put it in furrow with liquid fertilizer. It is pretty pretty universal what you can do with it, the handling of it. Um, but you know to go back to, uh, to to sustainability a little bit, this this whole process is part of sustainability, sustaining not only the the, the, the soil but sustaining the, the food source that we get. And and as we go on, I'll talk about something and I this is my terminology. I call it luxury consumption. And, and, and we have to, first of all, understand things like cation exchange capacity and base saturation, because you, know, you, you have to have this exchangeability, this cation exchange capacity. But if a soil can only hold X number of pounds or grams of something, 
it, it, it can't hold more than that. Once you're saturated, you're saturated. And so if let's take nitrogen, for example, if our soil can only handle, you know, 200 pounds of nitrogen, we're putting on 250 pounds, it, it goes without saying that we can't have, the soil can, can't hold it. It becomes, you know, um, it becomes waste basically. Um, my, my point on luxury consumption is that if you put too much fertilizer on there and the plant has all the food it needs, they don't rely on the microbes to do anything for them. Um, the microbes will do their thing, but they're not relying on them. So we have to understand what, what is optimum rate. And that's a, that, that's a key part. What is optimum rate that we, rates of fertilizer we have to put on there, for example, to get maximum benefit? Um, now, I, I know, I, I know uh, most of my friends are farmers, and I know we always like to sit in a coffee shop and brag that, yeah, we got 280 bushel corn this year. And, you know, that it's good to raise um, whatever number of bushel you're striving for and whatever the case may be, but at what cost? We, we, there's that point of diminishing returns, and we have to try to understand that if we're putting too much out there, is that the more efficient use of our resources or money, whatever, or can we do it better? And sometimes we have to, um, we have to get to the mentality, we can have our cake and eat it. Um, putting in these types of product in the soil, it, there's a lot of benefits. And as we, before we end today, I wanna to try and summarize all the benefits that we can get from them. And we're discovering more and more benefits all the time. But um, when, when we go to sustainability, we talk about food, we talk about energy, we talk about environmental concerns, about you know pollutions, too much plastics, um, what's happening with, with the pollinators, um, you know. But this got, the discussion is not going to go off in that tangent. I'm going to try and keep it to talk about soil microbes, and um, we're going to try and focus on on this formulation that Keith is talking about. Um, and I want to reiterate, anytime we want to start something, we start with a soil test. We have to know what the soil is deficient in, or sometimes what happened is that too much is not so good either, you know, um, because for example, there are some micronutrients that antagonize each other. Um, if you have too much of one, it could inhibit the, the uptake of another. So there, there's a very complex process here that we need to put some type of a understanding and correct any deficiencies or excesses that we might have. Um, we, we can talk about mycorrhiza, we can talk about um, back, um, bacillus, um, you know, we can talk about a whole bunch of different things. But um, if we look at one nutrient, let's talk about phosphorus, for example, and we'll talk about phosphorus, about the big picture. But if we get to a smaller um, um, nutrient, if we talk about something like, um, um, you know, magnesium, um, let's say your soil is deficient in magnesium. You know, this is, this is a very critical subject we need to understand soils. And I don't want to insult anybody's intelligence here, but I'm just going to get back to the basics. Um, magnesium is a key component of the chlorophyll molecule, and the chlorophyll molecule is what triggers photosynthesis. If your soil is deficient in magnesium, it can't have adequate amount of chlorophyll and your whole process suffers. Now you can put all the NPKs, you can put all whatever the case may be, if you're deficient in magnesium and the plant cannot photosynthesize to its capacity, then we're in trouble. Now we must understand photosynthesis a little bit too because one of the things that mycorrhiza does, it helps the plant to generate more chlorophyll. And, and that's one of the benefits of using mycorrhiza. But our plants, for example, let's take a soybean plant, for example. A soybean plant is probably only about 3% efficient on its photosynthesis. And, and that's because if we go back in history a little bit to understand photosynthesis, when the cyanobacteria crawled out of the water and start photosynthesizing, we had a lot less oxygen in, in the atmosphere. And so the ratio of carbon dioxide oxygen was, was very different. And so the, the, the enzymes that do this, this conversion sometimes get into trouble with more carbon dioxide, more oxygen now, because when the enzymes are trying to trap the, um, the, the carbon dioxide by accident, it grabs oxygen molecule every once in a while. And that's where the inefficiencies come in. So this is something that we, we, I wanna clear up a little bit that we must understand photosynthesis. 
And so there are scientists and universities working and trying to get better photosynthetic capability. But one of the things that, that mycorrhiza does, it does increase the amount of chlorophyll uh, chlor in the chloroplast, and, and, and that, that's a benefit. So when we're talking about efficiencies of, um, of photosynthesis, this is one benefit we can get with that. But um, on the big picture, one of the biggest thing that this mycorrhiza does is it's, um, it's, it's getting um, things like phosphorus and potassium and, and, and you know, um, nitrogen from natural sources. Um, when we put this product in the soil, for example, it starts to sporulate. And there are two, two tips to it, obviously. And around these tips, there are these bacteria hanging around there and they secrete enzymes and it's a very complex process. What happens then is one of the tip infect the roots. Let's, let's take a corn plant, for example. It grows directly through the cell wall and into the corn plant. The corn plant then, or at whichever plant we're talking about, the plants would then feed the fungus. It will give them carbohydrates or sugars, whatever it needs. And the, fun, the fungus would grow. It, it starts out as a, um, as a hypha, and one hy more than one hypha become hyphae, and a collection of hyphae become a mycelium. These mycelium, they, they, they're really tiny. They're about 1 to 1 5th the diameter of a human hair. And they get to the nooks and crannies and places where the root hair cannot go. Um, I've heard people make statements that, well, yeah, we have, um, we, we have a more root system, or, we, or bigger roots than whatever case may be. And that might be true with some product, but mycorrhiza doesn't exactly do that. What the mycorrhiza does is it, um, it becomes an extension to the roots, and it gets into these areas where the, the root here is too big to get into. And with the help of the, the uh, bacillus and different bacteria, they secrete enzymes and they solubilize the nutrients. For example, you take a soil test, we, you know, on phosphorus, on, on, um, phosphorus, it'll give it a P1 and a P2. The P1 is available, the P2 is unavailable, or somebody called it Bray and Olson test, whatever. We have a lot of phosphorus in, in the soil. It's unavailable. A lot of it's tied up in, in forms like calcium phosphate or something like that. What these organisms do, they solubilize the, the phosphorus, for example, and make them usable form. And the mycorrhiza then traps this stuff and transport them back into the corn plant like we talked about that infected the corn plant. And so the they, they, people say, well, why would the corn plant or why would the plant share its nutrient with this, with this um, fungus? And this is what we call synergism. It's a very good synergism there because they, they, the plant feeds the fungus, the fungus feed the plant. And what happens if there is a period of stress and, and there are different types of stresses, um, these, these fungi can work in, 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 in salty type soils or environment. Um, but what they can do, and I've seen this happen time and time again, is <clears throat> if there's a marginal drought, you know, they, they would bail you out for, for the, nothing works under extremely dry condition. I know last year we had, we were very dry in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. yep. And, 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 you know, I, I looked at my neighbor's corn. I look at my corn. I mean, we all had, we, we suffered from the dry weather last year, no question about it. And I was at least happy to see end of the year that the, my, my corn actually did 160 bushels per acre because I thought that was amazing. But that was one of the better yields out here. And what's interesting is that I only put about 70% rate fertilizer on my farm. And, and so this is what we're, we talk about having your cake and eat it too, where under these extremes of condition, the mycorrhiza would bail you out with, with a marginal droughty condition. <clears throat> and, and it gives you the, the option to, um, to be more efficient with your resources. I, I keep repeating these things because I, I know we got to explain this over and over and over what exactly they're, they're, they do in the soil. The, the other thing we have is that apart from them going into extracting nutrients in it, they build our soil structure. The little lumps and clods, they break them up and stuff like this. But like, for example, in Minnesota, we grow a lot of sweet corn and a lot of sugar beets and stuff like this. And, and we have um, these semis up and down the field. And sometimes they're, it's a little bit marginally dry or wet, whatever the case may be. We have a lot of soil compaction. 
And, and years ago, we used to go in there with subsoilers and, you know, try to break up the hard pan, they call it, and, and minimize compaction. And all we do is move the compaction layer lower and lower down. It still does not, you know, define to settle and have another compaction layer. What I found out, and we, we need to do some more work on this. Uh, we, we're trying to figure out, I think what's happening with the mycorrhiza, because they're so small, they get into this compacted area and they can loosen them up. And uh, we need some more work on this. We really think that there's something there that we can, we, we can expand upon. Um, I can't conclusively say that it'll reduce compaction, but it'll minimize compaction. Um, so basically, when 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 you put your product out there, put the, the microgreen product in there, it it um it grows in the plant and it starts extracting. One of the things we put into this NPK product for for um, green cover seed is we put in these um, bacteria that converts atmospheric nitrogen into ammonia, and, and that's a big big deal because you know we we talk about side dressing uh, and stuff like this. What what this what happens here, and there, there's different ones, you know. There's different companies have different um, bacteria, but they do the exact same thing. They take atmospheric nitrogen and for, convert them into ammonia. Now the ammonia form does not leach; it stays. The nitrate form leaches, and so we're putting in we're spoon feeding all year long the right kind of, of um, ammonia out there. Now people say they put anhydrous ammonia out there, which is, you know, it's true. But, um, and, and I get to trouble with fertilizer company when I say this, but I know for a fact when we apply anhydrous ammonia sometime, it is not very um, friendly towards the soil microbes. In fact, it, 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 it kills them. And so we're, we're defeating the purpose. We're, we're, anhydrous is efficient, it, 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 you know, people use it, it's cost effective and stuff like this. But it has some adverse effects with, with the soil, um, the soil organisms. And, um, and, and, and we do get this question quite a bit. And maybe I'll just ask you this because somebody might ask it later. So when you put that anhydrous on, it's 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 going to kill everything, you know, in that strip right where you put it. How far how far do you think those those deadly effects move out from the strip? I mean, is that moving out six inches, eight inches, ten inches from either side of that strip? Or is, is that just kind of a guess at this point? It, it's a guess, Keith. We don't know. Um, but we know that most of the microbes are concentrated at top six inches of soil. And when you put it in there, commonsensically, it'll tell you that, you know, we're, we're having adverse effect. And I, I don't want to get an argument with a fertilizer company. I'm just making a, a scientific statement here that it is probably not the best form of nitrogen, but it's, a, it, it, it's convenient and it's, you know, it, it's uh, cost effective. And so sometimes we have to ask the question, what are we doing to gain what? And so at this point, Keith, I would like to take a quick pause and see if there's any question or confusion before I continue. So anybody get any questions or any um, any um, objections, whatever the case may be? Yeah, I, I, I've got one point I wanna follow up on and I'll give people a chance to type it in either the chat box or the Q&A box there if they have a question. but. I really like what you said about, you know, our soils tend to have a lot of these nutrients in there, but they're just not available for plants. Right. In the example of magnesium, for example. So what you're saying is that if we have the right biology, a lot of what's not available can be made available. So we don't have to buy extra magnesium, put it out there yeah. if we have the right biology. Is that correct? Yeah. That's right, you know, the, and, and, and reason that the way that works is that it might be available, but it might not be available to the plant because the, yeah. the, 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 the root hairs are too big. They can't go into the, these little tiny little areas and, 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 and extract it. The, 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 the uh, bacteria and the fungus, they get in there and they secrete different types of enzymes and that's a whole different which enzyme does what and stuff. But from a very basic standpoint, we just put it out there, the, 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 the Micro, um, the bugs do their thing basically, and they extract Perfect. it, and they, and the mycorrhiza is like a transport sy system that gets it back into it. Now, people say, how much, how far does the, how far do they go? The, these, um, the, the mycelium, these, these hyphae, they would go for miles on the ground. I mean, they, they just keep on growing and growing and growing, and as long as there is um, living roots out there to sustain them. And this is where cover crop really, really helps because if there's no living roots, we have 
the, the mycorrhiza will not survive out there. They have to have living roots to survive on. And uh, Keith, maybe you want to just explain that a little bit further, talk about your cover crop a little bit, um, what, what are the different ones. But before we do that, I want to make one quick point here, that there, there, mycorrhiza does not colonize every plant. There are three things, we, there are three that we know for sure, um, sugar beets, um, canola, and brassicas. And I know people had made claim that they've seen increase in sugar beet yield. And I point blank to man, you're lying because it does not work on sugar beets. You know? so, so, and so that's the ignorance of this whole process. You know, we gotta be careful when people start making claims like that. So anyway, if you wouldn't mind, Keith, talk, talk about sure. your cover crop a little bit and then we'll go from there, okay? Yeah, well, you know, and, and that's why we love the mixes, having the diversity out there because we can put any of the brassicas, you know, the radishes, the, the canola, rapeseed, turnips, mustards, we can have those as part of our mix. And even though the mycorrhiza aren't necessarily going to colonize those, if we have that mixed with oats and peas and flax and sunflowers, all of which are fantastic hosts for mycorrhiza, you know, then my populations are going to be just fine. But if I was to go out there and just plant, and, and, and we did this, a lot of people did this in the early days, cover crops, solid, solid field of radishes. Well, that leads to multiple problems. One would be the mycorrhiza uh, depression, and the other one would certainly be, you'd have no residue left after that stuff broke down and started cycling in the spring. So that's, that's the value of having the mix, is that there's always gonna be something in there that the mycorrhiza are really going to attach to, and, and it will really support those populations. So, you know, we have over a hundred different types of cover crops. So there's, there's something that's going to work for almost every situation. And, and most likely it's something that can be part of a mix where we can bring together multiple things there. So uh, that, yeah. And, and mycorrhizae are such an important part uh, and they're difficult to get established uh, or at least you have to make sure you're creating the right environment to get them established. And so once you get them, you know, we've always felt that it's really important that you try to keep them because they will go from generation to generation or planting to planting to planting if you keep something growing out there. So my understanding, Sean, is that the things that are really bad for mycorrhiza, uh, one would be a, a long fallow period. Uh, one would be tillage because that disrupts that, that network that they're building. And then the other one is if we're putting too many synthetic nutrients out there to where the plant no longer has to try to call on the mycorrhiza for help. It can just pull the free phosphorus or the free nitrogen uh, that we put out there in a synthetic form out there. Would, would you say those are, are correct? That's absolutely right. And that, that, that's a good point. And we will we'll continue on there. For, now, you mentioned that when you do your mix, you, you, you know, you've got your brassicas, you've got your canola stuff in there. And the mycorrhiza will not colonize them. But what the mycorrhiza would do, they say take the peas or whatever else you have in there, they would work on those plants. But when they when they in, increase the soil structure or and stuff like this, all the plants benefit from it. So there's an indirect benefit. Although I mean, even in sugar beets, for example, most of the sugar beets are planted with cover crop because you know you plant sugar beets with a cover crop, obviously the wind blows them out, stuff like this. So a lot of people plant oats or something like that or different uh, cover crop to get their sugar beet established. And, and you know, they eventually come and kill the cover crop off and let the beets take over. But even those initial um, application of, of uh, if you put mycorrhiza with it, it starts the process and start improving your soil process. And so it, it, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it, it's a holistic approach to the whole process that even when it does not colonize the, the, the particular crop, it also, it, it makes it, the benefits are so many that you can't afford not to put them out there. Yeah, and yeah. so we, I, I want to take this thing a little bit and talk about, um, you know, what, what's optimum and, and <laughs> what's optimum rate for fertilizer. And, and I, actually, I don't know. I mean, it is what it is. Uh, but I, I, I do the math every year in my own farm because I want to make money in my farm and I want to be efficient, but I want to get optimum yields and stuff like this. And, um, I've experimented with 10%, 20%, 40%, 30%. Uh, and this past year, I, I put 70% rate fertilizer and I was questioning my sanity when it got dry. I thought, my goodness, you know, this is, it, it, it really paid big time when it got dry. So whatever fertilizer 
costs. You know, last year fertilizer cost was, you know, it was expensive, it was yeah, very expensive. Was high. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I made the decision like on my corn, for example, I'm gonna cut it down 30% because I don't wanna pay that much for fertilizer. Um, I think my farm is in good shape. I, I I got reserves in there. I go I rotate my crops and stuff like this. And it doesn't mean I do everything right, but I try to do a few things right at least. And so you know, it, it's like a bank account. You know, if you keep making deposits and you got a few dollars in there, and you become unemployed or something, you at least can go back and live on your savings for a little bit. And that's what these things will do. They would build the soil up for you. That in the event you have a pro a year like we had last year with drought or something. The, the, the benefits outweigh the, the, some of the costs. And so that's something that, you know, I can talk until the cows come home about all the different benefits. But mycorrhizae- well, and, and I wanna make just one more point to that. Sure. And, and this may not necessarily be a popular point, but I think it's valid, is that what you're talking about is exactly right. Many of us make those decisions on how much fertility to put on based on economics. The more expensive the nitrogen is, you know, the more we tend to cut back. But the problem has been over the years is we've had relatively cheap nitrogen. And so yeah. that economic factor wasn't there to kind of slow people down. And so we tended to have a lot of over application and we're paying the price for that now yeah. uh, with, with the nitrogen pollution in our, in our water sources. And it's not just ag, there's, you know, many, many different industries that can contribute to that. But we, we need to be making some of those decisions, not just based on the economics, but also on the environmental impacts. And, and again, this is where the bio, biological uh, mechanisms come into play because when we can get those, you know, we just don't need as much. And so we're both saving money as well as, uh, you know, doing less, you know, um, having nitrogen get away from our farm and get into the water sources. Absolutely. The, the other one is phosphorus. You know, well, first of all, we have a lot of um, unavail unavailable phosphorus out there. And we keep putting more and more. The, 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 you know, the, the, the concern we should have is that I, I think we have enough phosphorus in our deposits in the United States, maybe for 30, 35 years. And after that, we might have to go to Russia to buy it or something, you know. Um, so we, we have to think about conservation and using what we have. My farm in Minnesota, where I live, is between two lakes. And if you go in Minnesota in the summertime, we have so much algae bloom out there. It, it's a direct um, effect of the um, of too much phosphorus in there. Mm -hmm. And this is built up over year and year and years and years of um, too much. And um, so I had to work with about six government agencies to build a water filtration system because the, the water goes from one lake to the next and there's this little stream that um, this ditch that goes be right across my farm so we put this big um filtration system in there to to trap and, and test the water sometimes and see exactly what's in there and it's amazing that little how much purification that does it goes through a cattail swamp go through filtration stuff like this and i'm just sharing that because um we need to be a, be, be careful with too much phosphorus out there because I, nitrogen is bad enough, but phosphorus can be really bad for you know. Yeah. And you know, I, I like to go fishing once in a while. Sometimes I don't want to put my boat in the lake because it's so green and everything looks so you know. You got to come and wash your boat. Now I'm getting off on a tangent here, but it is a direct um, result of too much phosphorus. And so most people don't don't recognize that we're putting more than we actually need, and we have unav unavailable phosphorus out there. The mycorrhiza is a master of doing this. And this is a number one, I think it's the number one benefit of mycorrhiza. It gets in there and there's enzymes like phosphatase and whatever these, these um, bacteria would secrete and they would solubilize and break this bond with the calcium phosphate, it should be with the yeah, calcium phosphate and they'll, they'll, they'll make the phosphorus more usable. We don't need to put so much out there and turn our lakes green or in the case yeah, of yeah. nitrogen, that, you know, that we have, problem with um, groundwater and surface water and dead zones and whatnot and so forth. Um, we have to be careful because if we don't regulate ourselves, somebody gonna regulate it for us. And I noticed yeah. last, in, the, in the Netherlands last year, the farmers were protesting because the, the government in Netherlands came out and made a statement that we got too much fertilizer in agriculture and we need to do something. Well, 
we have to start someplace. We have to start this process. And, and, and first of all, Keith, I thank you guys for doing what you're doing because we can make all the products, but we need people to actually do the work and promote them to a certain degree. And um, I don't work for anybody. I'm, I'm an independent guy, but I find people that like these companies we're talking about, and, and I basically volunteer basically to help them to do the right thing for the future because I know what's coming down the road. Um, you know, all of a sudden some environmentalists become you know, big shot in, in Washington and, and things could change rapidly. Yep. And, uh, you know, it, 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 you know I, I used to be a Boy Scout leader and one of the mottos of the Boy Scout was be prepared. Mm -hmm. And I always tell people, be prepared for anything, because if regulation come down, uh, we should have an option, say, okay, all right, if we got to reduce our fertilizer rate, we, we know how to do this. We have organisms can, can bail us out, and we might have to say, we're not going to get 280 bushel corn. We got to settle for 260 bushel corn, but I'd rather is 260 bushel corn and save the environment than, uh, than, than try to pollute things, you know, because yeah. those, those days are coming. Now... I spend a lot of time in the Amazon jungle, you know, yeah, and 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 I, I I see a lot of things, and that's a whole different discussion about sustainability. I'm not going to go there, but I see what's happening down there, and and you know, as time go on, we're going to pay the price for a lot of things that we're not paying attention to, and that's why I write books. That's why I do educational seminars. That's why I try to explain to people that we don't live in the United States. We live we live on planet Earth. And what happened in Brazil or what happens in, in New Delhi, India, whatever case may be, it affects all of us. And these are the global regulations that co could come down and start affecting us. And so I'm gonna get off my high horse and get back on track here a little bit. But <laughs> it's, it's, it's an emotional thing for me to talk about sure. this thing because these are the right things to do. And, and I've been saying this for a long, long time. You know, I've been in the workforce for 53 years now, Keith, and that's a long time, you know. And I'm still I'm still actively working. I own the companies that that do some of these things. But get back to mycorrhiza, and we we have to get to the basics of it and what it is and what your formulation do. Um, we abbreviate them as AMF. AMF stands for arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, and and um, you know basically the, the the name comes from two Greek words which mean fungal roots. That's where this mycorrhiza come from. And so when we start tweaking with this, we start finding, we, we didn't know a lot. We would find one or two strains or, and they're there, but we didn't know how to identify them. And so eventually we, we come up with this formulation that you have right now, which have 10 strains, or we call them glumus, 10 glumus of mycorrhiza. And I'm not gonna go into each one, but we have a, a long presentation, what did everyone do, but collectively do, do the same thing. And then we have eight bacterial strains in there. And that's basically with some streptomycin added in, come up with your um, your microgreen NPK. What you have is a, one of the best formulations I've ever seen with this whole process. The, the thing that what's interesting with your formulation or what's good, it is the, the, the mycorrhiza is made in vitro in a test tube, in a lab. They're grown on plants without leaves. And if you ever get a chance to see that, I don't know if you have or not, but um, it's really I fascinating. Yet, no. It's really fascinating to watch these scientists, how they work and the, the, the intricacies that the effort they put in there. Uh, what's, what's unique about that is that when you grow it under control environment like that, you can, first of all, you can select out the, the more um, viable spores. The second thing, you minimize um, contamination. And this is where a lot of, I'm not picking anybody, but, but I'm, I'm telling the story the way it is. What happens is that a lot of time people grow them in large fields in the soil. When you harvest them, you're also harvesting the pathogens with it. So you don't have pure product. You're having all kinds of contamination with there. And before I get off too far to it, I wanna talk about some of the benefits here. I know some farmers in Florida, and I've, I've seen their farms, that they used to use a lot of soil fumigants over the years because they have so many diseases. And when you fumigate your soil, you kill everything. And so we started these guys many, many years ago trying to look at things like uh, mycorrhiza, trichoderma, different uh, microbes, you know. And um, eventually what they told me happened is that they don't fumigate the soils anymore. 
they have starved out or eradicated all the pathogenic ones and, and, and they kept their soil with the beneficials. Now they still got a few pathogenic ones. There's some cohensile ones and different. I mean, we don't know what's all in there, Key. To be honest with you, there's a whole host of things we don't understand. Mm -hmm. But in the big picture, what happened is that if we can populate our soil with the beneficials, we starve out or eliminate the pathogenic ones. And, and so we have uh, less diseases out there. We don't have to fumigate our soil. And what's really fascinating, I was looking at this guy, you're planting zucchini and peppers and stuff on his farm in Florida. And he said he doesn't, um, he doesn't have any um, fumigation anymore. But what they do, they have drones. And, and they, they fly the drones over. And if there's a little spot in there that show any sign of diseases, they, they mark it, they go out there and see if there is something, they physically remove those disease plants and they work on it to, to, to it's a little bit of work, but it, it's manageable. We have technology today with drones and stuff we didn't have 15, 20 years ago. Right. And so we can manage our soil and populate them with beneficial, um, be, beneficial microbes and, and have our cake and eat it too. And I, I want to make that point so people understand it's not how many more bushels of corn we get, is what are all the, the unseen benefits that we gonna realize every once in a while? Um, from a financial standpoint, though, you know, and, and Keith, you 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 know what your your product costs. I'm not getting to cost in here, but if, if I can reduce my fertilizer rate by 20, 30 percent, you know, I can I can save. You know, I'm maybe conservative here, but depending where you buy your stuff, you I, I can save 40, 50, 60 dollars an acre. I can take that money and invest upon a uh, microgreen product, for example, for a lot less than that, and have 10 times the benefits out of it. And now, people are not stupid, you, but they have to see the benefits, you know, uh, the, the, the word value, and we talk about value a lot, and value we talk over and over, we talk about value is benefit minus cost, you know, when, when, when we take the cost out of it, what benefit do we get out of the product? And we need to understand this total value thing, and th this is what Mycorrhiza does, it brings tremendous amount of value to the growers and to the soil and to the environment. And we need to give that speech over and over again. So when, when you put your microgreen product out there with 10 gluosins and you have eight bacterial strains and you have streptomycins in there, um, these things all work collectively to benefit the soil and, and the, the environment out there. So, uh, and again, at this point, I'd like to take a quick, quick break and, and any questions yeah. or concerns. Or, you bet. No, we've got some. We've got some good questions here. Uh, so, kind of saying on the topic of mycorrhiza, Brad is asking, uh, "What is the length of time that mycorrhiza can survive without a host? For example, you know, after the corn crop dies off and before a cover crop can be planted, what, what's that? What's that window look like?" Less than thirty days. I don't know exactly, but it's less than thirty days. They have enough reserve. They can live. They got you know these arbor schools and vesicles. They can survive on but they, 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 they would die. Uh, now, one thing I didn't talk about, I, I, I wish you talk about, about carbon sequestration a little bit because that's a whole different subject here too. But let, let's get the question that we'll talk about uh, carbon sequestration and endromail and stuff like this. So uh, yeah, let, I'm not sure if I answered this question, but if, if we don't have any live roots out there in less than 30 days, the mycorrhiza, now sometimes they don't die, they would sporulate, but in our cold environment up here, they don't survive. We, what we're trying to do, we're trying to get um, glumuses that would survive the winter here on cover crops. But um, so far, we have had a lot of luck doing that. We can some will survive, but you know, Minnesota is a tundra. You know, I mean, we 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 have a lot of cold soils in Minnesota, for example. Kansas, uh, Nebraska, you guys might be a little different out there. Of course, you get down towards Texas, to Oklahoma, and warmer climates, so you you have a lot better stuff. But um, you know, the, what end up happening, if we have cover crop, and a lot of guys have cover crop in Minnesota, they, they, they extend the season because, the, the, you know, the, the microbes, a lot of the time, if the soil temperature is above 50 degrees, they're quite active. So if you have cover crops out there, they would survive in there and they keep doing their thing and, you know, salvalizing phosphorus and it way into the fall. So you might have a, a much shorter window of, um, of uh, freezing. But if you don't have a cover crop and your your corn plant, you go harvest your corn in October, November. By December 1st, um, your, your, your microbes are non-existent. They basically die. Um, what, what end up happening when they die, for example, 
they they are not uh, lost. The 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 outer coating of of the mycorrhiza on on these um, mycelium is a product called glomelin, and that's a remarkable. It's a glycoprotein, basically what it is, and um, the, it it's a, it's a, it, it's it's got a lot of carbon in it. So when the, when the fungus die and and all this glomelin out there. The, the, the carbon that's sequestered is estimated to be sequestered for about 50 years. Now, who did that math? I don't know, but they, it, 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 it's a, it, it makes a good a discussion that you be sequester carbon. Um, and, and there's more to carbon sequestration than I'm gonna talk about right now because I wrote a whole chapter in a book about carbon sequestration, what it is and the benefits it has. But we, we, we can argue with global warming and carbon Dioxide and carbon sequestration. So that, that that's that's a whole different discussion. But um, the mycorrhiza, as a whole, from all its activity, is very efficient in sequestering carbon. And if you can have mycorrhiza that improves the photosynthetic capability of the plant, you can see why we're sequestering more carbon. And so the the holistic approach to this whole thing is a benefit, the benefit, and a benefit. And, and the cost is minimal, so the, the value is there. That, that's the word I want to get to, is what value does mycorrhiza bring to the average American farmer? Yeah, and if, you know, like with the, some of the numbers you were putting out there earlier, and I think it's very doable, you know, if you're saving 40 or $50, which is quite doable on fertility costs, you know, then you're looking at a four to five X, you know, return on investment uh, right away on, on, on this particular product. One other comment I want to make here on, on Brad's question about the length of time that mycorrhiza can survive. I think if you don't have a very long time frame, like the fall planting, like what we were talking about, it's really important to get a, a grass plant out there like cereal rye in the fall or oats in the spring, because those, those plants tend to grow pretty fast and they develop a, a good root system before you see a lot of top growth. And so just because you don't have a lot of top growth, it doesn't mean you don't have roots down there. And, and that's what's feeding the mycorrhiza. So uh, th that's that's where, you know, cereal rye is just, just such an incredible cover crop because it's got such a massive root system. It will germinate at 34 degrees soil temperature. So I get tired of people telling me it's too late to plant cereal rye because at some point you're gonna, your soils will get back to 34 degrees and you'll be able to to get something going there. So, you know that that's a great product, uh, and to 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 use something like that. A couple other questions here, Sean, that kind of relate around these products. Uh, Roger is asking, you know, how can you have live microbes in your dry product? You know, the microgreen is a is a dry uh, product. You know, talk just real briefly about how you put them into a dormant uh, state uh, that they can survive in that dry formulation. Yeah, they're spores, and spores are dormant. That's basically what it is. They don't um, germinate or sporulate until they get in some type of a liquid medium of some sort, like soil moisture, or if you know it, when you start go planting, you you sometimes put in your tank or something. Now, first of all, mycorrhiza is very tolerant to most fertilizer mix, starter fertilizer and stuff, uh, um, insecticide, fungicide, chemical as a whole. They're, they're very tolerant to it. But once they get into a liquid um, media, they start to sporulate. So as long as you can keep them in a dry formulation, those spores are dormant. And it's just like a seed, you know, you put a seed in a jar, it might be there for 40 years, but you throw a seed in some you know, soil, it germinates right away. It's, it's mother nature. It keeps the dormancy factor is what causes it to stay stable for a couple of years. Yeah, yeah, no, good question. Good, good, good answer there. Got a couple of questions around, and, and, and this is a legitimate question. Uh, Doug is, you know, saying that understanding ag, you know, Gabe Brown's group out there, they're very supportive of cover crops, but they're somewhat hesitant when it comes to adding biological additives as those products, uh, you know, you know, would you need to add them annually? So I guess the question is, is, is there a certain point in time, and Lisa has a similar question, like if you've been in a regenerative system for multiple years, are you going to see a lot of benefit from adding, whether it be mycorrhiza or uh, adding other types of biological additives, uh, or is is that boost that you see is it diminished in really really good systems? Boy, <laughs> it's a million dollar question. I, I, you know, and I I don't know. If we really know have an answer for that. Um, you know, and I go back to the the statement about. Um, 
what what value does it bring to you? You know, um, you know. Basically, I, I still try to get to the point that we we've been farming, doing a, a lot of bad things to our soils over the years, and it'll take a long time to correct them. But we have to start doing them. And um, I, I'm not sure if I'm trying to answer this question, but I don't know if I have an answer for you per se. Um, but we have to we have to reintroduce. We have to reintroduce what we've destroyed. Um, I'm not going to pick on a moldboard plow, but once a moldboard plow was introduced, I mean, we we plowed up the prairie and we 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 screwed up our um, our whole um, the whole biodiversity in our soil, and we recognize that now. And this has only been going on for the last few years. Like I say, I started this process of beetle back in 1983. It took about 20 years to even understand what the heck we need to do, and then start to find product. Where does it fit? How? Which one is suitable? Which crop did it? And so we're in we're this uh, very steep learning curve. But I think what we have, Keith, with your product, for example, uh, you know, like you say, you don't want to belittle anybody's product, but there's a lot of biostimulants out there that do good things. There are, there are a lot of companies that have good things. From a holistic approach, we, we'll keep trying. What works in your farm, Nebraska, might not work in my farm in Minnesota. So the geography makes a difference. If you're doing um, soils that are sandy, or a clay-based soil, they might react a little differently. We need to learn as we go what works on our respective farms and capitalize on the ones that work. And if something doesn't work in your farm, no sense continue doing it. No sense beating a, a dead horse, you know. But overall, I've not, what I've seen in mycorrhiza, it has been very, very positive. What it does not only this year, but a long-term effect, what it does to the soil and help the environment as a whole. And that, that's kind of the summary of the whole process here. It's really good. Sean, we can do a few more questions, but one of them was um, just asking about your your books. You mentioned you kind of built out a whole chapter on a, a certain subject. Uh, <laughs> can you share a little bit about where people can find your your yeah. books that you've authored? Well, the, the one applicable here is not going to be out for a little while yet. Um, okay. You know, I, I got all these books. Well, the you, got it, you got us all excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> now we a good preview. <laughs> no, I got books published, but... Um, in fact, in about two weeks, I'm publishing one on, on corporate business management worldwide, how, how we manage business ethically and stuff like this. But um, last year, I started writing this book on sustainability because I recognize the need for it. It's done. I got to get to a publisher, get published, stuff like this. But as time go on, and I'll, when it's on the market, I'll let you guys know. I, I used to write non creative nonfiction and stuff like this. Over the years, I, I wrote a lot of scientific stuff in different magazines and stuff like this. But um, you know, as I get older now, I, I'm, re I'm recognizing that, you know, I'm not gonna live forever. So I better put some of this stuff down <laughs> in writing here. But yeah, yeah when, when the book is out, um, I think it'll really, really help the, the people to understand what sustainability is. It's gonna talk a lot about food production and agriculture, but energy and, you know, the holistic approach to sustainability. Sorry, I, it's not in the market yet, um, but I'm, I'm getting busy. I'll put it in the market pretty quick. Well, we'll be looking forward to that when that comes out. Um, do you have one of your a favorite resource on mycorrhizal that you have? Maybe somebody else's book or a, a website. What kind of resource would you want everybody to kind of look into? Keith, you want to tackle that one? Dr. Alok is probably the best source I know. Um, you know, and he has a lot of papers and a lot of presentation stuff out there. Um, I, uh, he, in fact, he and I talk about writing something together with mycorrhizal. We haven't done it yet, but um, to answer the question. Dr. Aloka, he, um, he's, he, he's probably one of the smartest scientists I know. He's a good friend. And um, so anybody who has questions, you know, you can fun funnel it through Keith or something and yeah. we can get your answers for you. That's yeah, where the yeah. information comes from. And, and who Sham is talking about, Dr. Alok, is the founder and the president of Umahari, the company that makes Michael Green. He was, he was just in Bladen. He came and uh, visited us there in Bladen at Green Cover wanted to get to know us a little bit better and we just had a, a great visit with him. So yeah, if you got specific questions, feel free to shoot those over to me and we can uh, uh, kind of be the go between, uh, you know, with him and, and the people that have questions. Jake, do we have time for maybe one or two more? Yep, we can do a couple more. Okay. Um, so Brad is asking, at what point will a corn or soybean plant turn off its support of mycorrhiza? And I'm assuming what he means here is either if it has too much free fertility in the soil 
or maybe at what point in uh, as it's getting mature and that plant is starting to die, uh, when is it no longer considered kind of a, a host plant for these organisms? Well, the simple answer to that is that as long there's live roots out there, they will keep feeding each other. But my, my term of luxury consumption, what that means is that it means that the, the, the plant will continue to feed the fungus, but it's not getting a benefit from the fungus. So it becomes a one-way street because you got too much available. I mean, it's just like the welfare system, you know, if the government gonna give somebody free money, why should they get a job? You know, I'm, I'm not picking welfare people. I'm just making a statement that um, you, when, when stuff is, is there available and you don't have to work for it, yeah, it, it doesn't really, um, you don't make the effort basically. And so if you have too much uh, phosphorus or potassium or, ni or nitrogen, whatever available, the plant will, you know, the rotators would automatically pick up um, what's available and they don't rely, but they would have almost half of the energy that they, they generate sometimes will have to go feed these fungi. So, you know, if you're having pathogenic ones and stuff there, you're basically feeding something that, you know, there's a lot of question people say that you, we should put um, so like a sugar base or something in there for, for feeding the microbes. And, and the, I mean, the, the jury's out on that one yet, because I, I, I don't think that's a great idea. When we put these additives in there, we're feeding the pathogens also. And so that's, that's my theory in the whole thing, but um, we really don't know. I, I think things like mycorrhiza, for example, when they come from the lab, like your formulation is, they have enough nutrients with them to sustain them until they start um, getting fed by the, by the root system. So we don't need to put all these artificial bacterial food or fungi food, whatever, sugar solutions, whatever. I think that's more of a marketing ploy than anything else. But I know I get in trouble saying that because there are companies out there that sell these things. But common sense will tell you that why feed the pathogens? Yeah. And that's, yeah. that's, that's all I want to say. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Well, I think that's a good spot to wrap up. Sean, thank you so much for joining us. That was a, a real pl privilege to have you on. Uh, to kind of wrap up our biological webinar series. So we know you have a lot going on and you're busy. So thank you for taking time with us today. Um, thank you everybody for joining and uh, we will keep you updated on, you know, continuing education and webinars in the future. So with that, um, yeah, thank you again. Yep. And we'll, we'll be getting this talk on YouTube. Uh, if you want to share it with others, uh, all the previous seven are already out there on our YouTube channel. So feel free to go over there, subscribe if you haven't done that already. Uh, and if you missed some of the previous ones, I encourage you to jump in and watch them. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Great. I need to roll pretty quick. Appreciate it. Thank you, yep. Keith. And um, thank you, everybody. Uh, have a wonderful day. And, um, you know, if you got any questions, let Keith know. He knows to get a hold of me. Okay, thanks a lot. <laughs> have a good day. Thanks, thank everybody. Take care. Thanks, Sean.